It's a stress of James, and on this stress of Explains, we're talking about Megalodon. Now, today's request from a 10-year-old boy named Parker, who apparently his dad says loves these videos, so thank you, Parker. This video is for you. And I'm going to start off with not the toys themselves, but the actual fossils here. I brought them from, the, from my lab. And the idea is that this, this is a Megalodon tooth, an actual Megalodon tooth. And if you're wondering how I got it, my um, my wife actually bought it for me for my birthday, so like, cool. Bonus for her. So. Here's the story about shark's teeth and a fossil record. It's really interesting that people in, in the uh, medieval ancient world would find shark's teeth, and they, they one of the like like myths was that they were either called they were called tongue stones or dragon stones. And the idea is they thought these parts were from dragons that had died and had fallen in the earth and got buried and all that, and they would find them in the hillside because no one really put put together that the idea that you know no one today we go oh shark's teeth you Google it you see shark's teeth or a shark's jaw. Uh, back then, most people didn't interact with sharks very often, um, outside of like sailors and you know, you know and fishermen. So if you were living in some village or town and you see these things in the hillside and there's some mythology about it, you're like, okay, sure, whatever, you know. So um, it wasn't until 1666 or 67 that uh, Nick, that actually a, a fisherman pulled a shark out of the water in the Mediterranean. He cuts off the head, sent it to the Grand Duke of Medici in uh, northern uh, Italy. He sent it, he gives it to Nicholas Stano, a very important person in paleontology, and he looks at it, he dissects the shark's head and says, oh, these teeth of the shark's teeth look like tongue stones. Now, he may not have been the first person to say that, but he was the first one to publish it. So now it's like, he's, he's been, you know, known for that. Also, if you're a geology person, you know uh, the earth, um, uh, the layers of the earth, you know, that they, you know, how they get younger as you go up. He actually, actually named that as well. He's a really big deal in geology. And if you ever see a picture of Nicholas, Nick Stano, you'll see him wearing like Catholic robes because during the um, Reformation, he went to like Denmark and was teaching Catholicism. And like the church was like, yay. So he has, you'll see him with the cross and everything. Anyway, so here's one shark's tooth. The other one I have here, Meg Megalodon tooth. This one I actually got from the museum, from the Whiteside Museum. Uh, my friends Chris and Holly there. Uh, basically, you can buy them at the gift shop there too, but they gave it to me as a gift, and I, and I dig with them a lot. So uh, if you ever wonder, like, what do you, what you know? I, I work in a museum, um, and I go, I've gone to two or three digs in my, in my job, my museum job. I go on digs myself, my own, and then I work, go to digs in the Whiteside Museum and see more. So this, this is from the Pliocene Miocene uh, of Indonesia, so different species of Megalodon. Well, not species, different range of time. So, first and foremost, I want to point out Megalodon as a fish. Now, I always say this jokingly, but if you want to have like a, if you want to just throw away a whole afternoon, ask a biologist, how do you define a fish? It's, there's there, I've never seen less than a paragraph for definition. So in general, you're looking at vertebrates in the water, yeah, chordates in the water. <laughs> and the idea is this, um, as far as the big groups of fish go, uh, the earliest fish would have been these, well, earliest recognizable fish uh, for, that are made into toys. Are the jawless fish like this guy here? It's Cephalaspis, made famous by walking prehistoric beasts. There's jawless fish; they have no like lower jaw. A more famous group of prehistoric fish are called uh, placoderms. This is Nacolastius, the largest of those group, one of the largest, and they are called armored fish from the Silurian, for example. I'm sorry, Devonian. Uh, then we have osteoithes, which are bony fish, osteos and bone, ithes fish, and the main group you'll know. Are called the raven fish. So that's like the sawfish, the tuna, uh, eels, seahorses. Most of the fish, goldfish, they're raven fish, as you know. Lobefin fish are lungfish and coelacanth. And these guys are really important in fossil record, too. And that's, that should be its own video one day. Uh, then we get the chondrichthys. Now, chondrichthys means cartilage fish, and that includes sharks, of course, and uh, rays, eels, and skates. So there's a manta ray. Uh, and within chondrichthys, we have a lot of diversity. Uh, my favorite thing to point out are the ortho, orthocanthus. These are uh, freshwater sharks from the Permian, well, this particular represents the Permian period. And I've actually dug and found some of their uh, head spines, just a little spine there, and their teeth. They have, so I've actually dug that myself, kind of cool. But anyway, so chondrichthys are sharks, right? And that's where Megalodon falls in. So the idea of Megalodon is that, I mean, people are finding these really big teeth, and we see that Megalodon was a global species. I mean, other than the Arctic and Antarctic, North and South Pole, it was found in most of the oceans of the world. So the question then is, well, you know, what's it like? How's it form? Here's a problem. Sharks, for the most part, main fossilization thing we see, the remains, are teeth. Now there are some situations where we'll have cartilage or like I said the spine of a orthocanthus, but uh and and there's a few like I've seen actually seen one in a museum in Houston, I think a, a orthocanthus like a, a carbon like stain. But for the most part, there are no fossils of Megalodon outside of its teeth and a few maybe jaw bits that are cartilage too. 
And he said, what is cartilage? If you don't know, take your ear, you can bend it, take your nose, you can bend the end. That's cartilage right there. It's actually not bone, it's something softer. That's what sharks are made of. And that's one, and one of the advantages of having cartilage, because we as humans go, well, bones are better because we have bones and bones are better and we write the books. But the truth is, uh, if you're in the water having cartilage, you can move faster, you can turn faster, right? I mean, I've seen sharks like turn like that. It's really cool in you know, different videos. So as far as Megalodon goes, uh, I have my, the first one uh, I bought officially was the Safari uh, 2013 Megalodon. And this guy hits the point. Now, one thing to point out is that the name, what's in the name? Megalodon is actually the species name. Let me explain. The names we, of we know, like Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, uh, Velociraptor, those names aren't dinosaur species names. They're actually the genus or genre. So, for example, we as humans are Homo sapien. Our genus is Homo. Our species is sapien. The name Tyrannosaurus is a genus. Rex is a species. Velociraptor is a genus. Mongoli sorry, Mongoliensis is a species. So, for Megalodon, the name, the name Megalodon is actually the species name. Now, the genus name is, is well, is being debated now, but the genus name is actually Carcharodon, which is the same one as the great white shark. So, great white sharks, which are the largest known sharks living, well, the largest predatory sharks living today. Uh, I think right now, with Nosha, Noah, they're, they're, they're tracking one that's like 16 feet long, a female. But there are records of great white sharks being, you know, in their 20 feet. Um, one I heard about in, in their, the 30s, you know, they get pretty big as far as like the biggest one ever known in record. But on average, the ones we see today are, are like between 15 and, and like, you know, more, no more than 20 feet, right? So the idea is they, that, you know, looking at melanin teeth and the great white shark tooth, and they were very similar, and we only have teeth, so the idea was, well, they're probably the same thing. So the Carcharodon genus was actually in melanin species. Now, in recent history, the view has changed, where, and if you actually make Google this, I mean, I, again, Googling isn't the best answer always. I mean, people put, anyone could put anything online. Uh, as I say this into a video I'm producing. Uh, but the idea is that there's a, a group of sharks called the Otodonts, which are actually older than uh, the Carcharodont group. And it's now believed by many paleontologists that Megalodon is a part of that family. So the idea is that, yes, the actual serration of the, sh the teeth right here are very similar to Megalodon, uh, to gray whites, but the bottom of the part here looks very different than gray whites. So the idea is that maybe they're a different kind of shark because having this shape of tooth may be a conversion evolution thing where if you're eating certain kinds of prey, you have a certain kind of tooth, but the root may show otherwise. So that's, that's being debated now. So you, so I think either on my website, I used to have like C Megalodon, now it's O Megalodon because it's a new genus, but the species Megalodon has not changed, right? Um, also, I mentioned earlier with serrations, these little, uh, if you look at the, on the shark's teeth, you can feel the size little ridges. See, sharks cannot make their jaws go side to side. They can only go up and down. So I always tell my, tell my students, you know, uh, you can do this, a shark can't do that. So when sharks bite their prey, or at least a, if a gray white for, for today bites into a, a dead whale, it bites down and it shakes his head. The idea is not like disapproving its meal, it's actually sawing through the bone as it bites down each time, which is really terrifying. Anyway, that being said, so under the idea in 2013 of this guy being essentially a giant gray white shark, that this body plan matches. I mean, yeah, they make give him more features here and there, but having the multiple rows of teeth, which I think sharks have, um, I always tell my human friends that we are uh, mammals and we're particularly primates, so we only have a few teeth growing in if you're most, you know, adult teeth, baby teeth. Uh, sharks have, a, like, I call it a conveyor belt, because the teeth go forward. So they have teeth here, and then, and then one pops out, and one goes forward like this. So, uh, but I will say too, that people are often say that, oh, sharks have unlimited teeth. Uh, that's not necessarily true, because the thing is, they should run out of teeth, but the problem is we don't find old sharks, particularly great whites, you know, we don't find old great whites particularly. So, I mean, maybe they do run out of teeth, we don't know, they're, they're very mysterious actually, and we can't keep great white sharks in tanks, because they tend to die. Um, so, that being said, this guy here, given the science at the time it was made, and that's one thing to note too when I do these reviews, I do acknowledge that these toys are made at a certain time, and with the data they have at the time, I kind of just on that scale. Um, so, for example, the dinosaurs with feathers, like raptors, you know, in, in the 90s we weren't sure, quite sure about it, it was kind of debated. Now we're pretty sure we have a lot of evidence, so now I expect feather rapture toys. But, uh, but Meg, the Megalodon here, this guy from Safari, which is the most, I think, common or easiest to get a hold of, this guy here um, matches that, that line. Now, the next guy here is from a company I am not as familiar with called uh, Mo Fun Toys. And this one is, is uh, when I first bought it, my wife was like, it's, actually it was a gift, I'm sorry, it was a gift from my, my in-laws. But uh, she was like, this is uh, uh, very grotesque. <laughs> 
And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, it just looks really ugly. And I'm like, well, they don't make shark models to be appeasing physically. You know, the, it's trying to look at the animal as it's designed. Now, it does maintain the general gray white shark look, but the idea is that they're trying to kind of stray away from just these exact, really being gray, like a great white shark and white base. They're, I mean, by coloration, they're trying to change it um, and give it more of a bulk. And speaking of bulk and size, uh, how big are megalodons? And that, if you want to get in the fight, that's that's my way of doing it. Uh, the general thing thrown around I hear a lot of, which I wouldn't totally subscribe to, is for like for every inch wide in the tooth, it's like 10, it's like, it's 10 feet on the animal. It was just like, if it's a six inch wide tooth, it's a 60 foot animal. Uh, on average, the number one number I see most scientists calculating this are between 45 and 59 feet long, uh, or 60 feet long, you know. So pretty big, which makes Rick Megalodon the biggest shark that we know of, because why? The whale shark today, which is a filter feeder, is about 50 feet long or no, 40 feet long. So these guys aren't, you know, they're filter feeders, which means they open their mouths, ocean water comes in and they filter out that. They're not going and attacking and killing like large prey. Um, so they're still big. These aren't just scale, if you're wondering. It's a whale shark and a megalodon. Uh, but the idea is that, that that's what they're, we're thinking their um, size range, you are the biggest shark of all time. Now, that being said, uh, people often ask me, uh, you know, megalodons, did, did they eat T-Rex? Did they eat uh, mosasaurs? And the answer is very simply, no. They could never have eaten a T-Rex or a mosasaur because T-Rex went extinct before the megalodon evolved. Uh, dinosaurs and the dinosaurs and the marine reptiles like ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, which is a video on that. I already did that, I think, about four weeks ago. These are marine reptiles, not sharks or fish. Um, they all died out 65 million years ago, period, or 66 million years ago, last dinosaur. Megalodon didn't show up in the fossil record until about 23 million years ago. Now, there are members of his family that were in this time, time frame, but it wasn't Megalodon itself. So, so the idea, then they were smaller, of course. So the idea is that Megalodon itself would have never bitten to a Tyrannosaurus Rex or fought a Mosasaur. And there's a lot of videos online about that, but it's not a thing, right? So uh, also officially, uh, uh, you know, this is a part of the video, they keep, get you demonetized or whatever, even though I'm not taking money, <laughs> is that um, Megalodon's extinct. And I remember when I first started teaching at the museum, I used to teach in college and in, you know, geology students are just like, what's the science say? Here's information, move on. I had this adjustment with the public because, you know, in the public idea, you have to explain and debate and argue more than I do with other science people. And I remember particularly that little boy, he was like, Megalodon's still alive. And I'm like, no, he's not there. It's declared extinct. And I remember he was like, no, I saw a thing on TV. And this is when the Discovery Channel did the Megalodon still living mockumentary thing. And I was like, no, it's extinct. And I remember I was newer as a museum tour guide. So I had not learned all the tricks of the, I, mean, I knew the information and data was there. But how to engage the public like I do now is, you know. So I was like, no, it's not. And finally, like the dad was like, okay, let's, let's, let's move on. And my friend, who's really good with kids, she was who helped train me, was telling me that uh, she's like, when someone is that entrenched, what you tell them, or particularly a kid, is that go out and find one. When you find one, you will change the books. But until then, we have to credit the fact. You're like, that's brilliant. So these Melon figures, like I said, to me, either one's great if you if you put, put your hands on. Um, it's important because one, I mean, I love dinosaurs, the Mesozoic, but it's cool to have animals that are post Mesozoic, you know, post dinosaur time. So Megalodon falls in that group. And it's impressive because this shark was the top predator in the ocean for over like at least almost 20 million years. There was a top predator. Now, that being said, what did he eat? Mainly children. No, his main, <laughs> they were not children. Uh, don't calm down. But so uh, whales. So here's, there are two kinds of big types of whales and there are, are baleen whales, which are the ones that I absolutely love. All of my friends on Instagram, uh, uh, whenever I find a video of a baleen whale, uh, I just send, I'll forward it to them. It makes me very happy because baleen whales have these things, instead of having like teeth like us, like dents in teeth, they have stuff called baleen. So they open their mouths and it's like these filter things and then they suck up, take all the water in and then they close the baleen and push the water out. So any krill or plankton or any little fish that are in that get caught in that baleen. I think you saw this in Finding Nemo, if you're wondering. So the idea is that they're called baleen whales and they're, and they're gentle giants. And people go, why do you get excited? My friend asked me, why are you so excited about baleen whales? And I said, most of Earth's history, we, we, we have, we've had pretty large filter feeders. There was a, a placoderm that filter fed, like, you know, you know there's the biggest fish of all time, leaf at these, between 40 and 80 feet, depending on which, which source you read. <laughs> they're filter feeders. But a lot of most of, of the vertebrates in the o oceans and on Earth's history were like, I'd say, godless killing machines. You have chronosaurs and mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and 
megalodon, like the, you know, these all, a lot of these large animals are predatory. They're pre you know, and here we have these large like blue whales and right whales and gray whales, and these guys are just giant, nice guys. And, that, and to me, that's really cool, you know, and, and safe. Um, more on whales later someday. So here we have the tooth whale, uh, the largest tooth whale called a sperm whale. Now, tooth whales also include, uh, you know, technically are a branch of called dolphins, and orcas or killer whales are actually a branch of the tooth whale group. Uh, the sperm whales are most well known, and uh, sperm whales are cool for multiple reasons. One, they're the largest uh, tooth predator on Earth today. Um, two, uh, they have some of the loudest uh, echolocation. So when you and I just look, they have eyes too, but they use the, like, the, like, the, like sonar waves kind of thing. And, uh, but these guys have a history too. So what we're seeing is the early whales are going to the oceans, right? After, after the, all the marine reptiles die out in, in the in, in Cretaceous period. And as the whales are getting bigger, we see the sharks getting bigger. So it's kind of like Triceratops and T-Rex, where the old, like, you know, in the Jurassic period, we have allosaurus and long necks, you know, all over the world, allosaurus type animals and long necks all over the world. And the ancestors of the T-Rex and Triceratops are really small. And over time, the Triceratopsians and the Tyrannosaurus get bigger and bigger. Not, not, not an arms race, but getting bigger at the same time. What we're seeing with the whales are getting bigger and bigger, and the sharks are getting bigger and bigger. So just like T. Rex is the biggest uh, Tyrannosaur or predator dinosaur, and Triceratops, well, sorry, no, biggest Tyrannosaur, and Triceratops is the biggest horned dinosaur. Megalodon is like the biggest fish shark. It's, it's the end of this giant, this gigantic line, basically. So uh, there are, I think, new models coming out of the, of the, of the sperm whale ancestors that they actually ate. I have not gotten those yet. Maybe when I, if I do, I'll do a video. But the main thing we're saying is that it ate whales. And you say, well, how do you know that? And for one thing, we find whales with bite marks on their bones that match megalodon teeth. Two, they, they found, um, I mean, they found whale like the, uh, what's right here, the, the, the pectoral area where it's been like hit really hard. So it implies the shark is like coming from below and, and like breaking, breaking the ribs. Uh, whales are generally speaking very uh, social. And the idea is that if you are trying to take one out, they're going to turn on you. So you might want to come in and hit it real quick and, or bite a fit off and go from there. Because, uh, it, it, you know, usually great whites today don't attack adult whales. They, they scavenge them, of course. Um, but that being said, uh, that's what I do think that Megalodon may have eaten whales in that way. Uh, as far as the size of Megalodon, I mentioned earlier, the idea is that they have, been, they have found, um, a, I wouldn't say Megalodon jaw, the outline of a jaw on the ocean bed. I mean, that the, the megalodon would have died, sank to the bottom, and it's, you know, it's decayed. Its teeth just kind of fell down, and, you know, and there's like a shape of how big it may have been. But even then, we're not entirely sure, so that's why everyone's arguing the size of the megalodon. Uh, the final thing I want to go over with this cool shark, uh, and again, these stories are amazing. Get either one of them or both if you can. Uh, are, why is it extinct? Since it is extinct, right? Well, why, you know? And the answer is very simple. Uh, uh, not Actually, it's not. it's not. Why would I say that? It's not simple at all. <laughs> The, the answer is kind of complicated because we think of extinction as dinosaur death, giant fireball from the sky, and this, and this other things going on too, or the Permian extinction where the volcanoes just go uproar. Most extinctions aren't huge. They're not, I mean, every time period in the epoch, the changes of time, you know, from Jurassic to Jurassic, are a change of animals, a change of life. So, you know, you have um, Coelophysoids and the Triassic, you have Allosaurus and Jurassic, you have Tronosaurus and Cretaceous. You see those changes in animals, right? Um, so the big ones like Cretaceous and Permian are like really well known, but there are other small extinction events. I mean, the, 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 the antidote I was here, or the joke I was here, is that, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex is closer to us than it is to Stegosaurus, because Stegosaurus lived like 145 million years ago, T-Rex lived 65 million years ago. So like we're closer to it in time than it is to that time, right? So with megalodon extinction, the contributing factors are as followed. Uh, first of all, Megalodon is a top predator for a long time, and it is very specialized. What I'm saying is this. Animals that are very specialized do really, really well when the environment doesn't change because it's what the environment is, and it's doing great. But if the environment changes, it throws them off. And the example of that are, you know, for example, there are certain careers that as long as we have, you know, I'm trying to give an example. Sorry. Um, I had one when I planned this video and had a script ready, but then it's just gone. But the idea is that, for example, something like a pro golfer is a very specific job, a very specific set of skills. If we have a pandemic and golfing is not allowed outside or whatever, that job is no longer an issue, no longer an option, really, um, in the traditional sense. If you are a megalodon and you eat gigantic whales and that's your prey, or at least they're, they're young, you're kind of tuned to that environmental diet, right? Well, one thing to point out here is our old friend, Planet Earth, 
so Uncle Newpoint, if you ever look at Fighting Nemo, uh, in Fighting Nemo, there are turtles that are in tubes of water. Now, it's really cool to think about this, how they're in the ocean, all the water, and there's tubes of moving water in the ocean. I mean, not tube, like it's close up, but they're moving jets. And those currents go all over the world, basically. And that's kind of why uh, you can live in England, and it's hard to live in Northern Canada, <laughs> because the Gulf Stream brings warm water up to England shores, right? Uh, and and a Gulf Stream, who was discovered by Benjamin Franklin, officially, he was doing plumbing, plumbing the water and getting temperature reads and stuff while he was going back and forth between um, England, America and France, well, now America and France. So what happened basically was uh, during the Pliocene, about 2.7 million years ago, uh, Panama, as we know, it, was not there. There was an open spot between the what we call Gulf of Mexico, Pacific Ocean, and it was a move in between. 2.7 million years ago, uh, volcanic activity started up and it created Panama as we know today. And it would not be broken, or at least attempted to be broken, until Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> in the 1900s. Uh, but when that happened, it shut down certain currents. Um, also, the Pliocene, which is about between 5 million years ago and 2, 5 million years ago and 2 million years ago, the Pliocene is the time right before the Pleistocene, which is the last ice age, you know, the, uh, with the woolly mammoth and all that stuff. So, before the Pliocene, Pleistocene, the ice age itself, there was preparation for it. So, in the Pliocene, sea level began to drop because glaciers were forming at the poles, right? And when sea level drops, one that changes, I mean, that, that alone probably didn't, wouldn't affect the animal. I mean, animals adapt. But with the increased volcanic activity, the temperature changing, uh, you know, the, the certain baleen wells eat certain plankton, the temperature changes, different kind of plankton move. So the animals are, are having trouble adapting sometimes. And I say having trouble, I always say it this way, um, if the earth gets really warm, it's really awful for polar bears, but it's great for like snakes. <laughs> if it's it really cold, the bears are like, yeah, the snakes are like, darn, we, you know, so any shifting and changing will lead to some animals doing well, some not. But in this case with melanot, it's, you know, such a large animal, it, it depends on so many specific things in its environment that that shift and change makes it harder for it to adapt and particularly if the, if the wells is eating or changing then it's also you know its food supply is gone right um it has been argued by many that the great white shark had a hand or a fin and deposing melodon and the idea is that they are smaller so one example is north america we had in the ice age we had lions and we had uh saber tooth cats until we have just pumas or mountain lions right and we used to have jaguars until hunters uh, and the idea is that being a bigger animal, you, if you're a woolly, if you're a smilodon or simply cat, and you kill bison and mammoths, and those bison and mammoths die, then you have trouble hunting. You can't kill a rabbit; it's just as easy. But a mountain lion can trip, switch between medium to small prey. Same thing with the great white. It's thought that because these guys were smaller, and they can and uh, they can eat different prey. They can, uh, as, as their normal prey is dying, they can actually eat different things, and they may have outcompeted them. Um, because if you're that big, you don't do too well. I mean, we see it time and time again across the record. Animals get really big and they dominate the environment. But if anything changes, like, you know, they're, they're thrown out, basically. So that's one of the arguments for why. And there's more details on this, of course. It's very, very complicated. But for the most part, that's a big picture. So with that being said, I hope Parker enjoyed the talk on Megalodon. I, I appreciate you watching and everyone else as well. I always uh, appreciate any kind of comments or anything. Uh, also like and subscribe because I don't know what you guys want. I just want to talk about these things and there's a thousand topics here. I can, as I showed you today, I can do one subject or I can do a concept and compare it to. So with that being said, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Oh, next week we're doing human evolution. We're going to have a little um, humanoid things. And I've never taught it before uh, on video. So there you go. That being said, I'll see you later.